Welcome to Macro Hype Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to bring you the best in macro and markets thinking. To see our latest thoughts and analysis on the world, visit macrohype.com. Equity markets have come roaring back from the Reddit GameStop rebellion. So for all the articles written on the subject, the best strategy would have been to simply ignore them. Instead, it was much better to have focused on things like strong earnings from Amazon and Google. We actually did feature an article on macrohype.com that was kind of linked to this Reddit theme, which was a summary of academic work on whether using a smartphone to trade stocks changes your behavior. Turns out it does. It makes you go for riskier stocks. The other Reddit craze this week was silver, so we had commodity guru John Butler write on it. And in his piece, he highlighted which market players were vulnerable to the volatility in that market. I won't tell you here. Instead, you'll have to read the article on the site. We had a few pieces on housing, one on how the Fed wants a US housing boom, and another which flagged that UK house prices have started to fall, at least in January. Then we had a big picture piece on China by Raphael Halpin, who argues that all is not well in the Chinese economy and that the PBOC may need to cut rates. All of these pieces are featured on the MacroHive site. So if you're not already a member of MacroHive, I'd urge you to sign up at MacroHive.com. Dot com. Your first month is free, and then it's only the cost of a few weekly cappuccinos. Many call MacroHive the hidden gem for investors, so it's well worth signing up. Once again, you can sign up for a free trial at macrohive.com. On to my guest for this episode is Christian Hiller. Christian is the general manager and head of wealth management at Firstlich Kastelcher Bank, FCB. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. In Germany, FCB was actually founded in 1774 and is one of the oldest private banks in Germany. And before FCB, Christian was global head of multi-assets and solutions at DWS, which is Deutsche Bank's asset management arm, where he was responsible for 100 billion euros in assets. He's a real original thinker, so I assure you, you'll learn a lot in our conversation. So welcome, Christian, to the podcast show. It's great to have you on. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bilal. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and it's a great opportunity to exchange ideas and, and provide my view as well. Great. And Christian, normally before I start you know, the more meaty part of the conversation, I do like to ask my guests something about their background. You know, So obviously now you're the general manager of a prestigious private bank in Germany, but you've had a windy route to where you are now. So maybe you could tell us a bit about how you got to where you are. Maybe you could start with what you did at university and then what, what happened afterwards. Yeah, I did actually start physics, so I, I come from uh, natural science, and that has some, you know, probably relation to what we're going to talk about in a minute about COVID crisis <laughs> to a certain extent. So I studied physics and almost accidentally came into finance. I wanted to do a PhD, but somebody told me about the famous option book, um, Hull's, you know, book, and basically I read about it, you know, was interested in options, and I did one application to a consultancy actually at the time, that was Arthur Anderson, and they were looking for quantitative people. And so I thought, okay, might just stand in the application. And I was, to my surprise, actually taken and then spent four years at Arthur Anderson, basically, you know, together with a couple of other people setting up their financial markets practice. Uh, we were doing option pricing, you know, implementing risk systems and risk models and so forth. And, you know, after four years, I basically thought I was interested at the time in trading. So I really wanted to go in trading. And then I had an opportunity to go to London that coincided with an opportunity for my wife to go to London as well, uh, work for Procter & Gamble. And I started with Nomura. And, you know, at the time it was a little bit, all my friends said, okay, 2001 is probably not the best time to go to London, but it was actually the start of the credit derivatives boom. And, you know, as it happened, I started in credit derivative and I traded various different things over the time. So I spent six, seven years in London for Nomura and UBS and, you know, trading convertibles, hybrid uh, securities, but mainly in the end, CDOs, structured credit and so forth. So, you know, everything. All the fun stuff. Uh, yeah, all the fun stuff. <laughs> but I've got a very different perspective, you know, to all the products. Now, at the time, it was really, you know, an intellectual challenge um, at the end of the day. I mean, I can definitely say that I was never, say, did anything bad. 
I mean, all the products that, you know, we structured were in a way properly developed. There was good collateral on it. And our counterparties were professional counterparts. So from that perspective, it was fine. But one thing, if you look back at that time, obviously there were very complicated products to a certain extent, not all of them, not the whole securitization, because securitization as such, I think is still, you know, one of the good things you can have. And it's a good way to distribute or redistribute risk across markets. But, you know, there were certainly products like CPDOs or leveraged CPDOs, which, you know, you can argue if anyone actually needs that, <laughs> to be honest. So I spent seven years there, really interesting years. And then for private reasons, actually, as it happened just before the crisis, but not in hindsight, <laughs> we went back to Germany. I was looking for another job, so there's no real intelligent or, or let's say challenging trading in Frankfurt. <laughs> There's mainly sales, distribution, a little bit structuring. But I thought oh, I might actually, you know, switch to the to the buy side. So I went from the sell side to the buy side, I got an opportunity at DWS, uh, which I'm very grateful for. And again, you know, went right into the crisis <laughs> and had the opportunity to prove myself because of my credit derivative background. So it was obviously also for asset managers a difficult time. And I was able to help them to restructure some of their fixed income business. And with the now CEO, Stefan Kreuzkamp, and the CEO, Azoka Berman, I had a couple of challenging weeks and months, uh, let's say that. But we turned the ship around, um, as you would say nowadays, and, and even made a really an opportunity out of a very challenging situation. And the further course of my career, I was given the opportunity to build the multi-asset business, which I've basically done since 2009-2010 at DWS. You know, it was in the end business with about 100 billion of AUM and AUAs, um, overlay business as well, around 60 people, one of the top three houses in Europe. And you no, very good business, quite substantial also net revenue contribution to the overall bottom line. And, you know, you could say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm through with my career. Uh, but then I decided actually to uh, take a little bit of a step back. I reflected on my career, took a little bit of time out also, and wanted to build up my own shop with a couple of people. And we were fully online. We had, you know, funding, everything was sorted. And in the summer of 2020, then suddenly uh, somebody called me, the person that is now the head of the supervisory board of the bank that I'm working for now, so it's so Castell Bank. And he asked me to you know, help to review the bank's uh, fortune and the bank's plan into the future. And as it developed, you know, I made a proposal for a business plan. We had a lot of discussions. And in the end, the owners, the Lords, and it's owned by two Lords, gave me the opportunity to play a substantial role in uh, shaping the future of that bank. And that was very much in line with, let's say, my intention to build what was planned to be redefined investment with a couple of people. So essentially going back to the roots of investing in a sense of fair alignment, uh, alignment of interest in terms of investing like we would do for our own money with a very long-term you know, investment strategy rather than you know, short-term trading. You know, if there's arbitrage opportunities or you know, distressed opportunities, you try to get as much alpha as you can. But obviously, the, the biggest thing I've learned throughout my career is that timing the market is a fool's game and time in the market is your best friend. So, <laughs> And that's certainly something that I wanted to sort of employ and leverage as well. With all the know-how, all the knowledge that I've gained over the years, in combination also with a substantial part on the, let's say, sustainability. Aspect. So that's something that I would say is independent of the trend that we now see in the market. But nevertheless, it's something that's driving me. And I think where we in the financial sector have a huge responsibility because we have the leverage by investing into corporates and we can then tell corporates, okay, this is good or bad. And obviously that makes them move at the end of the day. Yeah, great. And we'll we'll talk a bit more about the industry and sustainability a bit later, perhaps. But maybe in terms of where we start, I do know that you like to think very big picture in the true sense of the word, rather than when people in markets talk about big picture, they mean the next week, you know, you actually think in years and decades even. But maybe we can start with the COVID pandemic. So obviously, that's been the biggest event from last year, and it's carrying over to this year. And so how are you interpreting the pandemic event in terms of some of the bigger themes that you're looking at, and both economically and for markets? How are you looking at these things? I mean, first of all, I have to say, it's a 
almost a life-changing event. <laughs> it has profound impacts on the economy and, and obviously on financial markets, but it also has profound impacts from a personal perspective. I think one of the things before we go into the market is, and I've, I've seen this phrase just in an interview, you know, accidentally a half a year ago, <clears throat> where somebody who is a basketball coach in the NBA actually used this word, he calls Ubuntu, yeah? I am because you are. And I think that sort of sums 2020 up for myself or for me and the planet in a way because it reminds you that we're not lone alpha tigers <laughs> you know the, the the financial market at least the one that i've experienced is, is super competitive and you know you always try to be the best but at the end of the day you know we are you know humans are people that need one another and i think this is a very important aspect we're here as a as a team on this planet and we live together so, you know the other profound you know incident or thing that has happened obviously that donald trump is gone now and uh, succeeded by uh, biden as, as a president and it, in a way, that's a nice coincidence in a way, because it shows that, you know, you've got a bad situation, but, you know, something good can actually happen and we've got a better future. If you look at it from a more, let's say, economic and then market perspective, I think there's, there's two things. One is the COVID crisis, the first time where people have experienced exponential growth, okay? And what I mean exponential growth, and I, I've thought about this in the context of a very simple thought experiment. You take a piece of paper, it's one millimeter, you fold it one time, it's two millimeter, okay? How often do you have to fold it for it to be one meter of height or one kilometer of height? And it's exactly 10 times and 20 times. Okay, so you can calculate it because it's two to the power of 10 and 20, which is one kilometer and one one meter. It's easy to calculate for, you know, any mathematicians, even my 17 year old son <laughs> was able to calculate it, but it's very hard for the brain to comprehend. Okay, so even I, if I think about it conceptually, it's almost as if I'm able to calculate it, <laughs> but not really comprehend. And in the same way, I think this COVID has hit, uh, uh, this crisis has hit us in a way that is very hard to comprehend. And, and sometimes even to an extent that people are, if they don't experience the pain right next to themselves, Okay. They almost think it's not really there, even though it's there and the next day it's there. Okay. And that makes it very hard also for politicians to manage the situation. And I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to be in Germany where a lot of people actually complain. But if you look at how we've managed the situation, it's actually pretty well. Okay. I don't want to underestimate the, let's say, psychological impact and the social impact this will have. And we'll even feel that in, in the years to come. But I think the way we've managed it is the right, let's say, trade off between, you know, what you should do and, but not doing too too much at the end of the day so i think that's that's important the other thing is you know bringing that into context i was just <laughs> reading out because i'm a physicist on, on two things and then that reminded me of this exponential growth has already been there for the last 70 years okay and i'll do that with two examples basically one is if you look at moore's law yeah so the ibm scientist who developed the first chips and and, and transistors okay he said that i think two years the number of transistors on the ship actually doubles and I'm, I'm a physicist, so I should know how many transistors there are on the ship, but I didn't actually know, so I had to look it up. And it's actually 2 billion transistors at the moment. And if it continues like this, it, you know, in I think one or two years, it will be 20 billion transistors on a fingernail size ship. And you can see this line. So if you draw it, you know, half logarithmic, you, you actually see a line. And it's something that it's very hard, again, to comprehend because we've seen this development We've seen these things that, you know, even your iPhone, as it is now, is 100,000 times more computing power than the, you know, computer that was used for the Apollo flight, okay, so for the first moon flight. So people have taken this for granted. And all these things have developed in the background. But now, you know, this event actually shows up and makes us look back, you know, what, what has happened in, in, in the last 70 years. And this has profound implications. This has profound implications for growth and the way growth, you know, has developed over the last couple of years. This has profound implication in the sense of, yeah, also globalization has so continued to develop, but also uh, I think now has come to uh, almost a limit and we'll probably have time to discuss and, and how we think and how I think the world is going to continue in the future. Now, looking at a positive thing is we've talked about this, you know, exponential pandemic growth, but beyond tech, for example, you know, a German company just sits about 
I think 30, 40 kilometers uh, from here in Frankfurt, so it sits in Mainz, has shown that, that humans are able to stop exponential growth. Okay, that's quite an amazing and a very positive takeaway. So 2020 and COVID has on the one side, very harsh realities and, and negative realities through the COVID crisis. And on the other side, it's also shown what humans are possible to do in a way that was never imagined before. Because if you think like, I think the previous, you know, vaccine was developed over the course of five to seven years, and then it had to be approved. I mean, this vaccine was, I think they started developing it or they, they identified the structure in January or February. And by the end of the year, we've got the vaccine. So this is almost like a miracle. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. You know, you're right. Psychologically, it's very hard to think about exponential growth or decay. It's very hard to think about that, but a pandemic does show how it can visibly hit whole health systems and so on. And you're right, it would be easy to become very pessimistic, but the vaccine has shown that, you know, there is something in humanity that can kind of respond to that. One of the kind of thing I often think about in terms of the pandemic is how in some ways what it's done is it's accelerated the adoption of huge amounts of technology. You know, something that may have taken five or 10 years has now taken five months, just like the vaccine turned out much quicker than everyone thought. Is that something you're you're thinking about when you think about kind of exponential times that we're in? Yeah, it certainly has. And it's a very weird situation because I was talking to a friend of mine who is in the venture capital sort of area. And he said to me, you know, look, Christian, it's almost as if you're in this stage of sleeping, you know, because you, you've calmed down, we've got this lockdown and so forth. And everybody thinks, okay, nothing is really progressing. Okay. But once we wake up, we will realize how much this crisis has accelerated and will accelerate change in every aspect, okay? Um, it will also transform a couple of industries at the end of the day, you know, to the good and to the bad side. I think there's not only winners you know, of this big change, as always. You know, I'm always go in, in a very positive sense with Darwin, yeah, who is always misinterpreted as, you know, people think that the strongest survives. And and what, what, what he really said, it's the ones that are most adaptable to change. And I think this is now true more than ever. You have to be adaptable. You have to see which direction things are going. And it's very hard from here also, and we'll go and, and talk about financial markets to predict the next couple of years, because, you know, actually you have to do a bit more scenario analysis in the sense of, you know, things that could happen. It's not that clear. Okay. It, it was, I mean, obviously again, in hindsight, but much more clear after the global financial crisis, because there were not so many options. Okay. It was a little bit of, of digital. Now we've got much more options and the way things could go. And and you were alluding to the, to the fact of, you know, digitalization, obviously. Um, I also think about different aspects, which, which are called wealth dispersion. I think wealth dispersion has accelerated to an extent that is I think actually unsustainable already now. And if we don't do anything about it, and there's a responsible of financial industry as well, a quite big one, um, then it will create social unrest. And, and I think part of the situation that you know we've seen in the US where Trump was able to mobilize so many people so easily, it's not only, it's, it's too easy to explain with just social media. I think it's also got to do with the implicit feeling of those people that they've been left out of this globalization and that there's huge wealth dispersion and that you know creates aggression that creates fear and i always tend to say that you know if you're under fear for the wrong reasons uh, you always do the wrong things and you're easily to be manipulated so this is something that we we definitely carefully have to watch yeah. And in terms of regimes changing, and you've talked about scenarios, you have to think in terms of scenarios for the next few years. Do you think the market regime, the economic regime has changed from last year? Is, is this like a big regime shift that we've been hit by? I think we will realize once we come out, okay, that this is a regime shift. And then let's first look a little bit back. The way I tend to think is, as you said, you know, from a first from a top down perspective, but but that doesn't mean that I don't look at balance sheet or, or corporates. Yeah, I'm in a way an engineer, and I'm really much interested in business models and so forth. So, but you know, let let's start with the other picture. If you look at efficient frontiers, the last 20, 30 years, you'll see. You have two or three major takeaways. The first one is, if you look 
let's say, I think it's about 20 to 25 years back, okay? Mm -hmm. And you plot the efficient frontier. It is the most surprising picture that you could imagine. Why? Because if you had a portfolio consisting of 10% of fixed income and 90% equities or 90% fixed income and 10% equities, you almost generated over the whole lifetime the same annualized return, okay? It didn't matter if you were almost entirely in, in, in fixed income or in equity which is really surprising but it goes back to you know i had a conversation with a with a very wealthy person who asked me for advice and he said you know christian i've only traded in in corporate bonds the last 20 years okay and this has been hugely successful and everything fine and and i'm a bit of a you know stomach trader you know he doesn't really you know go into the details and oh it feels right it's good but now i don't know what to do anymore and i said to him you know what you've done exactly the right thing over the last 20 to 25 years, okay? There's nothing that I could have done better in a way, okay? <laughs> Which is really strange. But now, obviously, it's much more complicated and, and it's much more challenging to generate returns. So th this is the first thing. Second thing is, if you look at the efficient frontier over the past 12 years since the global financial crisis, okay? So you'll see that on every point of the efficient frontier, the sharp ratio is at or above one which is like every hedge fund would give you a billion, <laughs> you know, if you would be able to generate that return or that sharp ratio. If you take an example of, let's say, a typical, let's say, 60-40 portfolio, so the famous 60-40, which is about 8% of average volatility, you generate 8 or you have generated 8% of return, which compounded, and compounding, as we know uh, by Einstein, is the eighth wonder of the world, <laughs> it gives you two and a half times, which means if you've invested 1 million in 2008, it's become two and a half million in 2020. I think the A1, you know, very few people have actually seen that return, Yeah, even though it's, it was very easy to generate with just two ETFs, so MSCI World, Barclays, Global Act. But also a lot of people haven't realized how good of these returns were, uh, were because they just took them for granted in a way. If you look at long-term capital market assumptions, so, you know, an exercise that we do that I've done in the past a lot based on, let's say, you know, fundamental, more fundamentally based models, because you know that markets remain irrational for longer times, but they mean revert to the fundamental mean. And, and, and these estimates are pretty good over seven to 10 year horizon. Then the efficient frontier is probably going to half. That means for the same risk, i.e. 60% of equity at you know, 8% ball, the 60-40 portfolio, you generate 4% of return. This is a big, big change, okay? And if you think that on top, we're going to move into a more volatile environment, you know, that this efficient frontier is not going to, you know, come down, but shift to the right as well. Plus the fact that, and, you know, somebody this morning, and if I, I'm not going to mention the name, but I'm going to mention the phrase that, he, you know, sent over via WhatsApp. He said the best phrase I've seen in the last <laughs> year is basically the transformation of risk-free interest into interest-free risk, okay? And this is exactly what's happening. So you have to take risk. And that's a big change. I mean, if I see a lot of pension funds, a lot of even foundations and so forth, who are very risk averse, typically have a, you know, 20, 80, 30, 70 sort of risk profile, they will have a very hard time to generate the returns they are expecting in the future. Okay. And if they, and if they on top, because they have typically risk limits, okay. If they use risk overlay techniques, which are typically very momentum style, it doesn't matter if they're CPPI, VAR base or so forth. Okay. The cost of that overlay will become infinite at the end of the day. Because my view of the world in the future is we'll see lower growth. Okay. So growth will probably, you know, half over the next 10 years. So not immediately, but you know, on average half over the next 10 years. And it's not only volatility, but but what's more severe is the drawdown, this disruptive nature will be much more severe, okay? And we'll also, so, so two things actually, uh, one is we've, we've been in a regime which was below 10% of volatility for a very long time. A regime which is, you know, ultra positive for risk. And that in combination with this, you know, super efficient frontier has also meant that a lot of people have leveraged. They, they felt so comfortable that they've leveraged their strategies and they take more and more risk. I think this time is over. You have to take more risk, but you can't, there's a, there's a limit to how much you can take. The other thing is that, you know, you will have much more 
not to the extent of that we've seen in March, April last year, but you know, larger drawdowns. Okay, so you'll have stable periods followed by you know sharp drawdowns and recovery, and that will will make it much more difficult to trade the markets in the future than it used to be in the last uh, couple of years. Yeah. yeah, I mean, why do you think we're going to move to that type of environment of kind of stable returns, but then these very large drawdown shocks? I mean, what wh- what is it about the world today that makes us more liable to have those? Because in the process of transitioning and investors adapting to lower growth, they will neglect at the beginning the reality. They, they will say, okay, no, this is wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, they, they will still play momentum. And, but, you know, with all these fast computer trading, with all these risk overlay models, with these sharp reverses, with the liquidity capacity not there being there anymore on the dealer side, um, on, on this transition, yeah, you'll have much more disruption. I, I think we'll be able to manage it, but it, it will feel much more weird and will happen much more. Often. And I, I think the tails will get bigger. I think we'll have probably larger upside tails, so white tails. You'll have the black swans and we have the green swan as well. Yeah. And why do you think growth is going to be much lower? I mean, look at global growth was driven a lot by uh, China. And China has moved from an economy that in the beginning was basically the labor market of the world and was able to produce, you know, anything from jeans to uh, chips in a very efficient way. They've developed now into a consumer led industry at the end of the day okay and on that transition i think growth will be smaller because they will become like a developed market as well and we we will go from double digit or we already have gone from double digit to to lower growth the other thing is i think we'll also see a bit of deglobalization even though i'm very positive on you know biden's arrival and uh, i don't think that this trade war is, is going to hurt us that much anymore and we will we'll be able to reverse a lot of things I think the way the Chinese think at the moment is a little bit different because they've looked at and said, okay, you know, Europe is, is you know, politically, they're, they're not really clear what they want to do. And, you know, they don't really work together. The US is, needs to sort itself out. We want to develop our own economy. And, and they've agreed this ASEAN sort of trade deal. They are you know, trying to create, from my perspective, their own sort of economy, which will be renminbi based. And that's also why uh, I think that renminbi will appreciate. And they're not so much dependent on a weaker renminbi anymore, because they will be much more, you know, self-contained <laughs> and, and self-dependent over the next couple of years. So so I, I think one of the strongest trends that we'll see in the next couple of years is, is definitely an appreciation of the renminbi, which will be reinforced by the fact that Chinese will probably be the first to start with a digital currency. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, in this kind of context, I mean, how do you think about risk management then? That's a very good question. I would say a couple of things. First of all, I think there's a big misunderstanding generally in the market that risk management is always thought as a way of market timing or as an outperformance strategy. Okay. And if if you think like that, you you haven't understood it (laughs) from my perspective. Risk management in a way is like an insurance strategy. And whichever way you're going to do it with, you know, options or with overlay sort of techniques like CPPI, VAR-based sort of techniques, it's going to cost you something. I mean, obviously, you always want to have a strategy that is risk managed because you want to, you know, to a certain extent, get some asymmetric behavior in your strategy. If you do that too much, it will cost you an enormous amount. I mean, I know people that have been stopped out last year and they didn't find any way back to re-enter the markets at the end of the day. And, And by costing, I mean... You know, in normal years, risk management costs you on average maybe 80 to 100 basis points, yeah, depending on whatever, where your risk level and where your, your leverage is in the strategy. I think in years like last year, it could easily cost three, four, eight, even 20%. <laughs> okay. So, so if, if, if you've got that in one year, you're totally out for the rest of your life. You won't be able to re-enter the market. So you need to be very careful in the way you do it. You know, I don't want to, let's say, provide too many secrets, <laughs> but I would say, don't use any sort of CPPI or var based techniques. Use something that is more akin to, let's say, vol, not targeting, but vol capping in order to, you know, get out of the market. But to re-enter the market, you need a different mechanism because it's too slow to react on the other side. And, and, and you can't go 
fully systematic, I would say as well. I think it's good to have a systematic way to get out, but going into the market pack um, is not a purely systematic game. Let's, let's, let's put it that way. I mean, the way I also tend to think a little bit about markets, if you are at the extremes, it offers you the best opportunities, okay? I mean, obviously, you are under fear or under pressure, performance pressure and so forth. But one of the best trades I've ever done is was during the global financial crisis. Because if you've got the long-term view, and if you're not forced by, let's say, your management or your CIO to you know, just look at mark to market every second and then be stopped out, but you know, rather follow a, a very strong fundamental approach, obviously you need to look for liquidity, okay? L liquidity can kill you at the end of the day, okay? But, but if you follow that principles, <clears throat> you just look, you, you don't need actually complicated models. You just need to do your homework and look at what is money good, for example. So I bought some ABSs in 2008, you know, nine, and those ABSs actually paid coupon on the full notional until 2015 and redeemed at 100 and I bought them at 10 cents of a dollar okay so this is one of the best trades I've ever done yeah it, it, it wasn't a huge amount but it was something that where I said okay I can write it off if the market really goes bad but I've done proper due diligence on the underlying collateral okay and it tells you that in times of crisis people don't distinguish or differentiate between things that are good or bad they just sell everything and the same was true, by the way. I mean, if you look at the loan markets in or high yield market, credit market in general, even investment grade last year, I think it was totally disproportionate. I mean, obviously, without the Fed, we would have had a severe liquidity crunch and maybe it could have gone really, really bad. So obviously, it was, you know, thanks to them that they turned it around. But it, it it's really weird to see some of those things trade at levels or look at 81s. Uh, I mean, they <laughs> traded down to two levels last seen probably in the global financial crisis and then bounce back to you know 80 90 100 again yeah so you could make you know 50 percent return just in a year in some of those uh, names at the end of the day and the same is true also on the upside so on the um, where we are now think of interest rates you know interest rates are super low and nobody things or beliefs that we'll ever see inflation again or ever see higher rates. But if you see, uh, think very long term, so, you know, 10, 15 years out, there is a risk scenario. And I would, you know, call it a risk scenario that, that rates are substantially higher, that we will see inflation induced mainly by the shift that we've seen from monetary into fiscal policy, you know, fiscal policy actually entering the real economy. And then we'll, you know, could see some inflation that will take a long time. But if you see 10 to 15 years out, so, so think about a swaption trade into the future. And there's interesting, let's say, optionality that you could buy relatively cheap to, to give you the opportunity in 10 to 15 years time, you know, to refinance your house or whatever at a, at a very low rate um, at the end of the day. And, you know, if, if that doesn't happen, you just write the option premium off. At the end of the day so so what i'm trying to say is you know at the extreme points of the cycles and i think we are at one extreme point that doesn't mean that we'll see a crisis again uh, in the near future but it means that you know it can't just continue as it has there are opportunities and you just have to look at these opportunities so so i think this in combination yeah don't just focus on risk management just don't just focus on fear, but see the opportunities in an in a almost anti-cyclical way. I think that's, um, that's something that is relevant and that will differentiate a good from a bad investor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you talked about you know, the, the risk that interest rates and inflation could be higher further down the road. I mean, there is a big debate in the market at the moment about inflation, reflation, stagflation. I mean, how are you thinking about that, you know, say for the next 12 months or something, or the next two years, say? I actually think that it, it's more something that is played by the markets than real reality or real risk. I think markets reality can remain lower for longer. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the market really plays this huge fiscal stimulus. I mean, Biden again coming with this 1.9 trillion, you know, uh, fiscal program and so forth. And, and we've seen huge amounts all over the world money that needs to be uh, put at work and i wouldn't be surprised even if you know germany at one time down the line will you know issue a a germany bond uh, for infrastructure and uh, schools and digitalization and so forth yeah i mean i would actually do because if you know 30 year uh, rates are below zero you actually get some money 
obviously, you know, exactly, you get paid to spend. So, um, you know, why, why, why don't you do it now, especially where we, where we need the money anyway? You know, normally I'm, I'm a very sort of rigorous, you know, I'm not in the Schäuble camp, but, you know, I'm rigorous on, on the balance sheet. But um, I think there's no better time than now, actually, you know, to issue some, some debt and also some government debt um, at the end of the day. But having said that, I think it's only the market that plays the let's say inflation game you know obviously we've seen headline inflation i think in the us is you know 1.3 core 1.6 the surveys or the expectation is in one year 2.7 i think it will be actually kept and we won't see it completely uh, you know going through the roof here um, i don't really see that risk i see it more longer term you know on a two three four year horizon because we first need to uh, let's say save the rounds of uh, the COVID crisis and, and and we need to see you know how we'll manage uh, the situation once we come out and which hopefully will be you know in the in the third and fourth quarter of this year but it's too early to see really inflation hitting uh, reality uh, it's, it's more the markets playing this at the moment and and only also really in in the us not really in europe yeah, yeah. And then, you know, in that context, and, and what you talked about earlier, in an environment where interest rates are very low, and it's hard to see how you can get huge returns from bonds now, does that then mean that we all go into equities, private equity alternatives? And if so, should we be worried about valuations, which many people are kind of concerned about, especially with certain sectors? That, that certainly is, is a big risk. I mean, first of all, let's say if you look at the portfolio, there's two things. First, you don't get the returns on the bond side anymore. And even on the credit side, you need to look very, very carefully and very deep. I'm actually a big fan of, of emerging market. <laughs> there's some value to be seen in high yield. There used to be very good value in, in, in some loans, so in more illiquid segments. And I think that will come back. So with, with a you know properly managed loan strategy, I think you can generate a, a good money um, also over the next couple of years. But generally, you have to go into equities, okay? There's no almost no alternative or what I would call real assets, okay? Probably not you know commercial real estate, more residential real estate. I think commercial real estate will have a, a hard time, <laughs> you know, given that we are all working from home and, and, and just... Uh, a little anecdote again <laughs> somebody told me this morning we don't work from home anymore we live at work also a nice sentence so what are the alternatives i think gold definitely is and gold gold for two reasons i mean because the uh, the opportunity cost is relatively low okay on the on the bond side and also the the, the effect of diversification is low i think there's some diversification benefit you know of gold it's, it's probably exaggerated in most of the research that's been put forward but i still think you know stress situation you know it's got some diversification benefit and i'm only interested in diversification and stress i think in normal times you know diversification can go anywhere and, and all this analysis about correlation i think look at stress correlation look at downside correlation and so forth uh, the normal correlation pictures you know that's it's it's a lot of math but um, it's irrelevant in a way <laughs> from a portfolio context and uh, the second thing is i would say defensive stocks so fixed income like stocks I also believe for that reason that, you know, which is a bit strange because, you know, the, the, the digitalization trend and the tech trend will continue. But I think given where we are in terms of valuation, if we're going to continue, you know, not in the same way as we've recovered out of the crisis, but, you know, with a, let's say, not so steep, but, but a flatter slope, we have to see a, a shift into a value uh, sort of stocks. Okay. And I think that trigger could be, you know, once it's more clear how we come out and, and back, if vaccination work, if we've got, you know, mass immunization buff, I would say, you know, 66 to 70 percent uh, in, in the countries. And if you follow, you know, goodjudgment.org, which is the super forecasters platform, I think in, in most of the countries, we're there around, I would say, August, September, latest October, you know, and, and the market will anticipate that much earlier. OK, so I, I think there is probably a let's say 12 to 18 months time where we will see a shift into value stocks and where you know surprisingly enough tech won't continue this stellar rise it doesn't mean that it won't continue to rise but um, i think the, the the gap that has been opened that is almost you know infinitely wide between growth and value stocks uh, will be closed to a certain extent so you know value stocks more defensive dividend type of stocks inflation linked bonds and obviously you've mentioned alternative strategies 
Now, the thing with alternative strategies, I'm actually a big fan of, you know, private equity, if it's well managed. I'm a big fan of, you know, infrastructure debt, uh, loans um, and other alternative strategies. And, and there's, there's a lot to be discussed and told, but that's, you know, probably part of a, another podcast series on private markets. Having said that, the differentiation between good, bad is quite big. Um, I, I think the demand is is so huge that a lot of people go into these asset classes and they don't fully understand it. Okay. And part of the beauty actually comes <laughs> from the effect, which in this case is good, that you don't have a daily mark to market and it saves you uh, to 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 jump into behavioral finance traps okay <laughs> so 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 that's that's a good side but the other side is and i can highly recommend you know make proper due diligence of what you want you actually investing in I mean, I guess one challenge with private equity is, as you said, there's a big range in terms of performance and quality, but it seems like a lot of the good PE funds are closed to many people. Now, is there the case that there are actually other PE funds that you can get access to? Or is it that these supposedly closed PE funds, there are ways to get access to them? I think that the ways to get access to will be changed and will be disrupted as well. I mean, we're not there yet in, in terms of, you know, blockchain based tokenization and so forth and and fractional chairs and so forth but you know i've even seen platform for fractional chairs on uh, for for art for example okay normal art that you as a normal person wouldn't be able to afford i, I think that will develop also for you know more illiquid uh, markets and that will disrupt the market but we're not there yet i think that there's two things on if you take private equity as an example i definitely believe that you know, if you look at firms like, and I don't want to make any advertising, but, you know, I know people who work there, but, you know, Partners Group, um, KKR and so forth, they're doing an excellent job also from a management perspective to turn, you know, to, to see efficiencies, to turn things around at companies and so forth. So you can get the extra, I would say, you know, management alpha and, and know-how leveraging. Yeah? Obviously, it's very hard to get access there. If you don't get access there, there is... And, and it's, you know, been published, actually, uh, even, even in The Economist, you, you could run a strategy whereby you take a small and mid-cap portfolio and you tilt it very, in, in a PE-like way, to certain industries and sectors. And then, you know, Warren Buffett style, take a leverage of 1.3 and so forth, which you could still do in a usage format. And you will be able to generate um, PE beta, which is probably better than let's say 70% of PE funds, <laughs> not, not, not the good ones <laughs> in a much more efficient way. And, and that's something that will come that people have started doing. So I think also competition there will change the market and, and uh, also differentiate. I mean, in the same way, maybe later we have got a bit of time to, to think about the, you know, how the market changes and uh, who will survive and, and who will uh, cease to exist. I, I think, Again, COVID will accelerate the change in the market quite substantially. Yeah. And in terms of, you know, risks to lots of people's uh, portfolios, what types of things are you looking at? I mean, one of the risks we, we've actually spoken about. So if we get an inflation shock, that definitely is a risk because then you will see, you know, your whole diversification completely breaks down and you'll see bonds fall and and equities fall and and we've seen you know some of the these scenarios in the past you know where where rates in the US when the, the Fed started uh, you know hiking rates again you know we saw these sudden jumps I think that's definitely a a severe scenario the the other one is more I mean, if you look at the financial industry now and the way stocks trade, and if you look at the real economy, I've actually got a neighbor who's a you know PE guy, and yeah, but he's in the real economy. He always tells me, Christian, we are already starting to restructure. I see so many problems and challenges and so forth. So he's you know in in automobiles, he's in other industrials, he's in the farming sort of business. Um, it's pretty pretty tough. So I think the market to a certain extent is almost ignoring the risks from an economic recession i hope severely that or, or very strongly that that you know all these fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus will will help us through but the reality is we'll definitely see a lot of defaults and you know people running out of business in certain industries and and the question is how the the whole of the economy will 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 manage that so it's it's not a given that will come out totally positive here 
Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've got obviously a huge amount of experience in the financial industry, and now you're running a private bank or you're, you know, the general manager at a private uh, bank. You know, how, how do you see the financial industry? Because it strikes me, at least in Europe, at least, and maybe to some extent in the US, that you have you know, very low interest rates, negative rates, you know, very large costs, you know, IT costs that are huge, personnel costs that are very large, you know, it, it's hard to kind of get much visibility on on like improving returns, you know, over time, you know, especially with such a flat yield curve. So that that's kind of very bearish kind of picture on, on the industry. And then you have all the fintech guys, you know, chipping away at all, all the different, you know, parts of the, the pipeline, so to speak, or the infrastructure, you know, so it's, it's easy to paint quite a pessimistic picture. So I mean, how, how do you see things? It's a very good point. Um, first of all, I would say, if I've learned one thing in life and in, in, in my f- career is everything is relative. Okay. So we always think, I mean, even this sort of risk management sort of thing, yeah, that you're not want to lose more than 5%. Actually, if the market turns 50 yeah, uh, down and, and you only lose whatever 10, I think you can be totally happy. And I've, you know, uh, I had a recent conversation with, with a very wealthy person and he sees himself more in the sense of, okay, his benchmark is the percentile which he is at at the moment relative to his worldwide other, you know, wealthy, wealthy people. And he wants to maintain that. So in a very relative sense, in order to do so, he actually has to take risk. He can't be, you know, even if he's got a billion, he needs to take a whole chunk of equity <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> so in that sense, you know, everything is relative. And, and you know, you could argue, okay, everything becomes more competitive, but that's in a way the nature of the game. I mean, we've at the beginning of the interview, we've discussed exponential growth. I think everything in the value chain becomes more and more efficient. And you as a bank or as an asset manager, you have to, very much differentiate where in the value chain you want to position yourself, number one, and where your sweet spot really is and where your value add is. And to give you one example in a, in a much more sort of broader scale, if you look at the asset management industry at the moment, I think it's more than ripe for disruption. It's it's very old style in the sense, the way the incentive structure works and the way the technology works and the way service in Germany, we say Beratung, yeah? so how you service, how you advise clients actually works. I feel better advised going into an Apple store and talking to a 25-year-old who is totally passionate, very knowledgeable, and tells me exactly about all the details of my you know, Apple Watch <laughs> than going into a bank branch at the end of the day. Okay, so, 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 so that model will totally change from my perspective, okay? And it will either go, you know, robo or it will go to high quality, excellent advisory. In the same way, if you look at, let's say, on the Y axis, you have on the bottom beta and on the top alpha. And on the X axis, you have let's say a boutique on the left-hand side and the Amazons of the world on the right-hand side, okay? If you look at the far right, spanning the alpha to beta spectrum, I would put a house like BlackRock, okay? So, you know, Larry Fink, Rob Capito have done a, you know, (laughs) great job in understanding if you want to get big, technology is a big game and you have to leverage that and you have to become a, you know, powerhouse across all asset classes. But there's probably only three max three to four worldwide who will win that game. They're, they're for me, the Amazons of the world. On the left-hand side, you you won't have a boutique in beta and you will only have boutiques in alpha. And that's two parts of alpha. One is what I call service or advisory alpha. And the second part is, you know, actual performance alpha. So talking about, let's say, the Bram Howards of the world, Cheney, you know, Sempera, <laughs> and the, let's say, pick days of the world with, um, you know, very personal advice, high quality and extra service around the, let's say, normal standard at the end of the day. Everything in the in the middle, I think over time will disappear. And, I, I, you know, somebody, uh, I think it was somebody from Bain or McKinsey just recently told me that's, that's called the Death Valley. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a pretty harsh uh, description. The reason why it is, is and, and, and at the moment, you still have many 
asset managers and, and wealth boutiques in there because they live based on a captive distribution model. Once this captive distribution model is is disrupted, which will happen over the next, you know, in, in, in some countries, you know, very traditional countries like Germany will probably take longer. In the UK, it's already happened. <laughs> in, in the US, it has as well. I, I think that will be massively disrupted. And you have to decide yourself, you know, do you want to be a boutique, somebody like, like Fundsmith, you know, who is just specialized in, in global equities, you know, very dedicated, the real alpha house. Yeah. If you do a bit of alpha for, you know, average or high fee, you won't survive. Okay. And if you don't do beta on a large scale or even smart beta on a large scale, um, and I'm talking about, you know, even, even mandates, passive mandates, you know, 500 million, 1 billion plus in tickets, boom, 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 then it's very hard to survive because let's say uh, the fee pressure and the industrialization will drive the market towards that model at the end of the day. And if you look at the the, the Porsche Taycan, um, you know, how it's been produced <laughs> these days, yeah. If you look at the level of automation and the level of efficiency there, if I compare that to the asset management industry, I think we're in the 16th century, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. One question I do have about Germany is, you know, I worked at Deutsche Bank for a long, long time, as you know. And what struck me about Germany, the German sort of both the buy side and the sell side and the retail side is just how overbanked it is. You know, you have the Landesbank, the Sparkassen banks, you know, it's very labor intensive as well. And then also, if you look at the holdings of households, they don't really hold much equities. It, it's very kind of bond centric. You know, it, it just seems like it's just structurally not positioned for the world that you've just described. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. And that's a big challenge and even bigger challenge now. I mean, uh, you've mentioned two things. One is overbanked. Um, I think that can change. I don't want to be, let's say, too drastic, but I think that, you know, the COVID crisis will mean that we will see some consolidation in the banking sector, okay? And in areas that are probably not, you know, the Deutsche type of clients or... <laughs> And so forth. Okay, so you know what I mean. I think that that will definitely come because the you know the, the the let's say the normal sort of loan business that has been done in the last couple of years has been done by those uh, sort of banks, and and that will be affected one day, uh, one way or the other uh, through COVID and quite substantially. So we'll see you know consolidation, banks going together, and so forth. I also see that on a European basis, there we might see a start of consolidation in the, in the, in the banking sector. So to pan-European banks, um, I think there's even an opportunity from an investment perspective, if you're smart on that. So that's on the positive side. The other side you've mentioned is is something that is is, is really, I feel bad about, yeah? because, you know, the best thing you can do is also for your kids is a savings plan. Yeah? And and I recently read an interesting article that there was a guy, um, he posted this thing on LinkedIn where he said, or made an exercise in terms of if you have a 30 or 40 year savings plan and you invest every year on the worst possible moment in time or on the best possible moment in time, actually, it doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that you consistently invest over time. And actually, when you invest at the worst possible moment in time, if you've got you know the same amount yeah you buy more shares yeah at that point in time so you know the cost average effect you know works for you as well so it's we we need to we need an actual mind shift we've seen actually quite positive signs and i'm not really sure what it's got to do with if it's got to do with a you know reality that people had more time at home and think about their you know, financials. I mean, obviously, we've seen this rise of, of, of trading like the Robin Hoods, the trade republics, the, you know, flat tax of the world and so forth, which I see very, you know, controversial, uh, to be honest, uh, because it's one thing to bring people into properly investing or into nudging into, you know, trading, you know, in a senseless way at the end of the day. But that's, that's two different things. But, you know, long term investing is something where the I think the knowledge and the financial knowledge is not uh, very much developed here in Germany. And, and something that, you know, I speak to a guy, or I've just recently spoken to a guy, um, his name is Daniel Jung. He has a YouTube channel with, uh, is probably the most popular uh, mathematics tutor in, in, in Germany. It's, it's immensely successful and it's all for free. Uh, and I had, you know, this idea that we were bouncing in terms of, you know, how does education of the future look like, which I think is actually, and he thinks is, is hybrid. So it's a combination of on and off. You need the human element of the, and you also need the human element, not vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the teacher, but also with your peers and so forth to develop in particular if you're at young age. But the thing is there that there's almost no 
financial education in the in the German school system. There's there's relatively little need, or there used to be little need, because we've got a relatively, let's say, social pension system. But if you look at the wealth that could have been produced just by a very simple, let's say, savings plan, yeah, then and, and compare that to where people are now by having missed been, uh, missed out, then it, it it it's a pity. It's really a pity. And 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 going back to what I was saying earlier, I mean, look at two thousand eight between two thousand eight and two thousand twenty. Okay, uh, let's say you just had a hundred thousand. Okay, so a hundred thousand invested at a sixty forty, it's two and a half times. So 250,000 in 2020, or you just stay where you are, or actually, you know, after (laughs) negative rates, you're you're actually in the negative space. So it's a difference between 250,000. I'd also say, even in the UK, when I look at my kids at school and speak to other parents as well, the financial education at school over here in the UK is pretty terrible as well. Um, yeah, I think that's a that's kind of a global phenomena where for some reason, basic things like that just aren't taught for some reason, which I think is a big issue. It's a big issue, but, but I think we could, I mean, look at Germany, for example, we've got this uh, nuclear decommissioning fund, okay? We, we should make much more out of it to become like the Norges of Germany, from my perspective. And then, you know, if this works, if that model works, it could be a role model how people in Germany are actually investing on a long-term basis. Yeah. And and I think this is a huge chance, but we've got this chance now and we need to take it. And there's a lot of political discussion and a lot of things are not moving forward in the way I would have, you know, hoped. And 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 you also need somebody that can, you know, articulate that and communicate that um, you know, in the media and so forth and, and make this, you know, translation to, to normal people so they really understand. Yeah. I mean, one thing I have noticed in Germany is that real estate prices have been going up, residential property prices have been going up a lot. Now, is that is that because, you know, the, the famous German renters are are buying property now? So they're they're starting to view property as an asset. What's your take that? I mean, is that is that like an investment decision or uh, you know what it is. On the one hand side, it's positive for the people who you know have profited from it and who are on the right side of the wealth distribution. It's mainly, let's say, the wealthy and the rich people buying second homes, third homes, you know, family houses, and and they tend to go much more into property than they would go into equity, even though they would have done much better with equity. Okay, but the typical, I mean, I've got a lot of friends, they, they've got second or, or third homes, which, you know, if you ask them 10, 15 years ago, they would have never thought about this at the end of the day. So it's 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 sort of the rich getting richer in a way, which is, you know, I see quite critically, to be honest. Obviously, you know, they're, they're doing the right thing for themselves. You know, you can't criticize them at the end of the day. And it is a lot of foreign money, which has never been in Germany because of a very boring property market, it has entered over the last couple of years. Um, the property market here. I mean, if you go to the big cities, you know, I mean, even Berlin, you know, which which has been, you know, for many artists, the place to go because New York is too expensive, <laughs> is, is now becoming too expensive for, for them to stay there. So then looking for the next, whatever, uh, they go to Spain or Portugal now, <laughs> yeah. uh, Frankfurt, Munich, and so forth. So, so, so there's, there's huge demand. And, and I, I don't see that this is going to stop in a way. It's not going to rise as stellar as before. And obviously, it's a function of, I mean, mo- most people don't understand the relationship that, that you know, a property investment in a way is like a bond. And it's also got a duration and there's a much, let's say, more complex way to hedge the duration than in a normal bond. <laughs> and, and it's a much more liquid investment. And, and and people will have a hard time, I think, if they haven't done their liquidity calculation right, yeah, that if they will be, let, let's, you know, go into a scenario where rates really in three, four years go substantially up, they have to refinance the value of the collateral, i.e. the house goes down. I think this you need to watch that. Yeah, I think not everybody has done this liquidity calculation in a in a, in a very proper sense. <laughs> okay, no, that's great. I thought we could you know wrap up our conversation with some personal questions, which I ask all of my guests. You know, what one is, and I know you think a lot about these sorts of things. Is one is how how do you manage your information and research flow? Because obviously you have got a lot of things to focus on, but there's you're inundated with research and ideas and uh, news information. How do you manage it all? You know, I I tend to 
speak to people like you who are very, let's say, focused and are able to condense information and filter information. And there's a lot of people out there who just reproduce information or they just tell a story around information. I think what is super important is, is you know, try to identify and, 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 and I have a bit of like different communities around myself for different topics, yeah? even up to, let's say, psychology or, you know, history and so forth. So people who are naturally interested. And I've learned a lot from, you know, these super forecasters, you know, Phil Tedlock, um, you've probably heard about and, you know, the Good Judgment Project and so forth. And the way how they think, they're, they're very open minded. And they, they read and listen a lot, but they also filter, okay? If something is not good quality, they take it out very rigorously. And then they are able to, to condense it. And I think what's also important to bring things down to first principles, okay? To, to if, if, if somebody can't explain it in a, in, a, in a simple way, most likely hasn't understood it himself <laughs> at the end of the day. So, so look for the right people. And, you know, also in our research model, we have, you know, I, I tend to go with, obviously, you need to have one or two, let's say, big banks where you, you know, have, have a large platform and access, you know, to, to some of the markets, but I don't need anything in the middle. I don't need many of the big. And then you have these small boutiques, which are, you know, creative thinkers, you know, people like you who, who are able to, to understand and, and connect the dots and see what really matters at the end of the day. And I think that's, that's really key. And, and that will become more key because all information is available. I mean, I was doing, you know, in, in, in COVID times, I do, was doing a Python course because I had a bit of time and, you know, I was uh, trying to go back to, to Python. And, and one thing that almost shocked me is how easy it is to get the best teacher in Python. And you could choose between any on all of the platforms and you pay a hundred dollars. You do a one month course. Yeah, it takes you whatever, one and a half hours a day and you can learn everything everything that and, and all information is available i mean if you've got one topic it, it's just a matter of it's so much information that a you have to decide okay what do you really want to know because you can easily get distracted oh there's another thing here there's another thing here another thing there so so choose your topics yeah and then within the topics be you know very clear on you know what you want to achieve and who you talk to at the end of the day yeah, yeah, makes sense. And then the last question, is there a, any book or books that have really influenced you, you know, in kind of a work context or even personally? I would say two things. Uh, there's almost an exponential growth in very good books. And, and I don't know if it's got to do with the fact that I'm now more looking at good books <laughs> more than before. Or if, if there really are, um, I've, you know, I've got a, almost a bookstore, you know, in my, in my home now uh, because of books that I bought or uh, I got as presents. But if I would say three, let's say, books that have influenced me or that, that had profound impact is one is actually Rumi poems. So Rumi is a 13th century uh, Persian poet. It's, it's, you know, very much on philosophy, psychology and so forth. Something that sounds very different from what we are doing here but if you're not let's say mentally stable mentally clear and if you can't set yourself away from let's say the daily noise and all these financial markets i think this is something that is super important i mean it's that's certainly one thing second thing is there's been a lot of research on you know about why people are successful or not successful i think one book is super good and that's called growth mindset from carol dweck and she's developed this growth mindset concept and you know i, I can highly recommend everyone <laughs> to read it because it makes you understand why some people are successful and i'm not gonna i don't want to judge that you know if successful is good or bad but you know these are people who believe in themselves they have got the grit and they get things done at the end of the day yeah? and the third one is even though i have to say i'm you know sometimes a little bit critical about him but he's certainly got some great or has got some great work done is ray dalio and his work, uh, book principles so those three like Rumi, growth mindset and principles those are the, the ones and, and and one book that i still have on my list is a must read is promised land by obama who's one of the i would say greatest leaders that we've seen in the last years i have to say your your range of books is probably one of the most eclectic we've had so far and i don't think anyone's mentioned Rumi and Ray Dalio in the same breath. I'm a big fan of Rumi as well, as it happens. What I find nice about Rumi is it's, one is it's timeless. So although it was written, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, it's still very relevant to today. And then also what Rumi does really well is he brings kind of very deep concepts into the mundane, into the day-to-day. -day. So he 
kind of gives examples of like cooking or something or going to a tavern and uses that as the way to express deeper ideas rather than going to very abstract concepts. And so it's, it's really accessible at sort of multiple la layers. Yeah, he's got one which is one of my favorites and, and I didn't understand it for a long time. It, it took me actually a while. It's called The Guest House. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's very good. Yeah. Okay, well, with that, I'd, I'd like to sort of thank you. It was, an, it was an excellent conversation that we had. I learned a lot. And if anybody wanted to follow you somehow, what's the best way for people to kind of follow your, your thinking, if that's possible, or, or track you in some way? I've never been, let's say, the greatest fan of social media, to be honest. <laughs> I, I have started on, on LinkedIn to, uh, you know, publish both you know some private things and and so you know for the bank you know for for castell bank i will do much more let's say thought leadership articles for the bank so for firstly castell bank you know in a, in a in a in a more profound way as you know i also you know, work together with a few guys and do you know some advisory for for simpera so so on and that you know capacity as well and probably a couple of articles on medium you know the the platform will be forthcoming that's with the ambition let's say to give back what I've learned in a way to educate and provide transparency. Yeah, it's not to really, you know, to to I, I'm not there to have a great profile. Okay, <laughs> you know, we've got big ambition with uh, you know the private bank with with, with firstly Castells there. It, it's an exciting job, and and there's I uh, will be in full demand there, but. You know, when I publish in, the, in let's say, in the private capacity, the, the, the real, there's an intrinsic motivation to give back a lot of things in a sense to brighten transparency. It's because it's one of the industry which is, on the one hand side, it's intellectually challenging. It's super exciting. There's almost no area. I've thought really to go, uh, when I stepped out of DWS, maybe into a completely different field. But I was almost dragged back in because, you know, the it, it's almost a gift to speak with so many let's say, gifted and intelligent people in this industry, okay? Sometimes it's misused and, and, and there's a lot of, you know, black <laughs> sides of it, but I think it will get wider and wider and better and better, you know, as we develop also as an industry. But it's, you rarely have any other industry where you have so many, you know, exciting, interesting and diverse people. So, so in, in, in that sense, you know, give back, you know, what you've learned, be transparent and, and also try to make a case for long-term investing in the sense, as you said, you know, make sure that maybe even into, into the German education system, there's something that, that, you know, gets back, maybe even, you know, do some YouTube <laughs> videos for free, uh, some educational stuff for free, which is uh, the tricky bit is to boil it down into what I call a KISS principle. So keep it simple and stupid. Okay. This industry, the, on the one side, it's so exciting, but on the other side, it's got the almost the uh, how do you say it's, it's a bit like a drug. Uh, everybody makes it so complex, okay. And and the more complex you make it, the more intelligent you you seem to be. But the opposite is actually true. I mean, if if, if you uh, let's let's be honest, if you can't explain it to your own kids, you've probably failed in understanding it yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very true. No, that's really that's really great insights there and good references. Well, I'll add some of the links that you mentioned in the show notes, like your LinkedIn profile, and then also the bank as well. So people can go there to see anything that you're doing. But with that, thank you very much. It's, it's great to have you on. Thanks a lot, Bila. It was a real pleasure and good luck to all of us and, and stay healthy in 2021. Thanks for listening to this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a rating and let other people know about the show. Also, sign up to become a member or subscriber to our research at macrohive.com. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.